All right, uh, I'm Warren Roth. This is Abby Brasington and Alex Tampas, uh, and we are Evolution from Apes to Humans. Uh, so I'm going to start with the phylogenetic tree down here. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, so our project focuses primarily on the Australopithecus genus, from Australopithecus anamensis all the way up to Australopithecus africanus, which eventually branches off to the Homo genus. Um, a few particulars about this phylogenetic tree. So those tan bars indicate the time span in which fossils have been found that correspond to each species. Uh, another aspect is this right here, it says homo species question mark in general. So that indicates, that's one of the questions science still has an answer is, they have found fossils that don't correspond to Australopithecus africanus or homo ruoffensis. So it's probably like a transitional form um, is how we would explain that on the phylogenetic tree. Uh, another thing to note is how long Homo erectus lived. I uh, lived over a million years, and uh, Homo erectus had a lot of these key traits that we're going to talk about. It was a very successful species, so that's also worth noting. Um, now I'm going to pass it to Alex. She's going to talk about our driving force of evolution. Yeah, okay, so our driving force of evolution, which is pretty much what we're saying caused all of these traits to evolve, was environmental change. Um, so pretty much during the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene period, which ranged from about 5.3 million years ago to about 2.5 million years ago, there was a global cooling and drying period. And pretty much what we're saying is that the environment went from like a mesic, which has lots of vegetation and water and lots of trees, so like pretty much a wet environment to a more xeric environment, which is really dry. Which, like, you could think of it now as like more of a what you would see like in modern day like savanna type environment, and pretty much. And down here, this is kind of like what we're talking about. Um, this is like a correlation between our genes, like genetic structure and climate. And as you can see here, like, see how it goes from like wet to dry. Um, this blue part is arid, which is like the same thing as a xeric environment. So. Like the gene pool, would there be like a directional selection towards the arid environment whenever, or yeah, those um, organisms or species would be like selected for, so they would be more likely to survive in an arid environment when it was dry. And the same thing happens for when it's wet. Um, there's a directional selection for the moist environment, and those um, species with those genes would survive more. So now, passing it back to Warren, so he can talk about the evolution of five. Yeah, so over here uh, in general is a timeline we made of key evolutionary steps, um, beginning with Australopithecus and all the way up to uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, so to start with, 4.5 million years ago is the evolution of bipedalism. Um, so Australopithecus anamensis, uh, you can think of it as semi-bipedal. Uh, so one trait they had is this a wrist locking mechanism, uh, which indicates that they were knuckle walkers, you can think of them as. Uh, they still uh, use their arms for a significant amount of movement. Um, and at this time, uh, although climate change is happening, uh, they still live in mostly an arboreal environment. Um, and the same goes for Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, they also had this same uh, mechanism of uh, joint locking mechanism in their wrists, uh, as indicated by, through fossil evidence. Uh, and so they were also semi bipedal. Uh, Australopithecus africanus is the first fully bipedal species, just like us. Um, and the main question is why did this trait evolve when it did? Um, and as you can see here on the phylogenetic tree, at about three million years ago, that's a key point of environmental change. Um, and at this time, the landscape is very open. Uh, there's not heavily wooded areas. So uh, previously, if you were semi-bipedal, uh, that would be an advantage because you could still use your arms to climb trees and such. But out in the open here where there's not many trees, uh, you're at a disadvantage if you can't use your arms for other activities, which is what uh, bipedalism allows you to do, is you can now use your arms to do different things besides movement, making you more efficient. Um, and now Abby's gonna talk about the evolution of the brain. Okay, so two questions we wanna deal with with the brain is when and why did it occur, the change? Um, so let me point out first that this is the beginning of the change. It's not the point where it actually changes. So 4.4 million years ago is when it begins to change, when we begin to see the shift. And so we have two lovely skulls over here. And this is the Homo erectus skull, and this is a human skull. So I will reference back to that in a minute. Okay, 
Um, so first I want to talk about the actual brain part. And so in the brain, you see a growth and development as the change in environment occurs. Okay, so when the environment changes and when the diet changes, so the brain and diet kind of go hand in hand. So when the change in the environment goes from the shaded area to the dry area, there was a force to change in, from vegetation-based diet to a more meat-based diet. And so in this meat-based diet, there was more nutrients, especially proteins. And so this proteins allowed for growth and development of the brain. And then if you can see on this graph right here, there's a change in the skull, which I'd also like to point out. So in the homo erectus, like actual skull part, it's much smaller than the human skull, as you can see. You can compare, it's much smaller. And then you can see that the brow line, the ridge, is much more prominent here than it is on the human. We don't even hardly have one. Also, if you look at the jawline, <laughs> there is a really defined jawline with a chin here, whereas it's not as much on the Homo erectus skull. Okay, and so now I want to talk about the diet. So that occurred 3.6 million years ago, and again, relating it back to the environment. So when they went from that shaded environment to the dry environment, it was necessary that they changed from C4 foods, or C3 foods to C4 foods. And C3 foods are things such as like nuts, berries, fruit, um, things that are easy to access and they're easy to gather. Whereas the C4 foods, as you can see, I'm gonna direct y'all to the screen over there. Um, the C4 foods uh, contain meat and vegetation. So it was important to see that when they shifted um, from that shaded environment where it was easy to access that fruit and those vegetation things and then there's a lack of the vegetation in the dry environment so they had to resort to the meat okay and this leads you to the teeth development so in 3.6 million years ago the teeth started to change along with the diet and so the teeth were originally in chimpanzees and gorillas and some of the earlier species they were extremely, the canines were the big difference. So the canines originally were extremely pointed and they were sharp, they were prominent. Whereas now you can see that in us and in the Homo erectus species, you can see that there is no sharp, prominent canine teeth. And this is because of the change in their diet. That was the force that changed the teeth. Because the diet, when you would try to rip, like if you're thinking about eating meat, and you're trying to rip and tear the meat, if you have pointed canine teeth, that's gonna get in the way. So you need to be able to rip and, and chew it sufficiently um, with the more blunt teeth. And so now Alice is gonna talk about tools. Okay, so around 3.3 million years ago is when we started to see tools within fossil records. Um, these are some of the earliest tools. It's a rock. It's actually not just a rock though. Um, on, um, they use these rocks to, um, they could hurl them, throw them, they also use it to like bang on stuff. These are probably some of the earliest tools that we've seen. Um, also, there have been four other tools, I mean, um, technology like advances too. I mean, obviously we don't use rocks anymore as tools. So, um, this is where cognitive thinking kind of comes in in a way because they had to, like, these hominids had to think more cognitively to develop more advanced technology, such as like whittling tools and like making them sharper. But anyway, archaeologists have like identified four different tools, like mainly within fossil records. There have been um, choppers, which have been like obviously used them to chop things. Um, flake tools have been used to chisel things. Crude biface tools have also been found. Those are like axes, kind of, and then. Um, Hand axes are like the same pretty much as what I just mentioned of the crude biface tools, except they're just more technologically advanced. Also, there have been um, tools found where it's like they have like a pointed edge kind of, and they use these tools, like these hominids use these tools to like, since they're like kind of more of a scavenger species, they would find like these car carcasses, I guess, or like, um, organisms that have already been preyed on and they've used like these sharp tools to like pry the meat from their bodies and then like going back to add what Abby said like 
that kind of relates to the diet because they're getting more of like the protein and nutrients whenever they carved all the meat off these bodies. Um, they think it's the Australopithecus, like Warren was talking about, down on a phylogenetic tree. Um, it could be them, but then other scientists aren't really sure because they weren't sure if the Australopithecus were um, mentally capable, like didn't have that mental capacity or cognitive thinking to pro like produce these kinds of tools that were that technolog technologically advanced. Okay, so I'm going to change it a little bit, and we're going to talk about another uh, prominent feature, which is hair. So, two million years ago, there was a change in hair. So, as you can see, at the beginning of the phylogenetic tree, the species were pretty hairy. And now, if you look at us, we're not as hairy in comparison. Um, and so, you can see that it was based on the environment. And, or, well, there was two different hypotheses, and the first one was that it was based on the environment. And so the first one says that they needed to cool off. So when they made that change from the wet and shaded environment to the open environment where there was a lack of shade, they needed to be able to keep themselves cool. So, you know, hair gets hot. So when they wanted to make sure they were cool, there was a selective pressure that selected for a lack of hair. Um, the second hypothesis is the more widely um, uh, accepted one, and that is parasites. So, in fur, it's a nice place for breeding of parasites, for things like ticks, for things like um, leeches, things like that. It's a real big place um, where you can breed, and they spread diseases through that. And so, in order to protect themselves from diseases, and in order to protect themselves, um, there was a selective pressure to, for loss of hair. And so, those species that lost the hair, um, survived better due to lack of diseases. Okay. Um, now I'm going to talk about hands and we see this evolutionary change kind of come up around 1.8 million years ago and I'm just going to talk about the anatomical structure to begin with with the differences from early hominids. So um, early hominids had probably longer like more slender fingers. Their thumb was actually very immobile. They didn't really use it at all. Well, like compared to us, like our fingers are now like more straight, like not as bent as they used to. They're like shorter for dexterity. Um, our thumbs are actually useful. Um, I'm going to relate this back to what I, we were talking about environmental changes. So where these like long slender fingers would come in handy are like in the mesic environment, let's say like my arm is a tree branch. They use like this four um, finger grip to like swing from trees because their thumb wasn't used so they'd hold on with these long fingers and like swing from branches and this is how they like got around places whereas whenever this um, environmental change occurred to a more xeric dry environment we had they had to adapt there weren't that many trees so and then there's also going back to tools they needed more dexterity to make these tools and evolutionarily that was a more advantage to have more dexterity and shorter fingers to and now we're talking about running. Uh, so yeah, last point, uh, which evolved around 1.5 million years ago, is running and the ability to run. So Australopithecus africanus was a scavenger. They could not run. Um, and they would find dead organisms and get their meat from those. Uh, it's not until Homo ergaster and also Homo erectus that we see the ability to run. Um, so if you look here, this is uh, Australopithecus afarensis, and here's Homo erectus. And Homo erectus has several traits that uh, Australopithecus afarensis doesn't have that allow it to run. It has a longer Achilles tendon, a shorter femoral neck, which allows for greater hip mobility. Uh, it's got a balanced head, slender rib cage. All these, among many others, all these contribute to its ability to run. Um, and this makes sense at the time because if you could run, you'd be at an advantage for many reasons. Firstly, uh, you could move greater distances. Uh, Homo erectus was an endurance runner, so uh, not only could your group get up and move to an area where there's more food, there's better shelter, uh, but also at this time we see hunting, the ability to hunt. Um, and corresponding with 1.5 million years ago, the evolution of running is uh, the evolution of more advanced tools. So the fossil record at this time, we also find uh, tools you could throw. Um, and this uh, supports the idea that part of the evolution of running had to do with the ability to hunt down food sources. Um, and so, now we have a short video on uh, 
facial morphology and how it changed over a six million year period. Um, beginning with Aurorin tugenensis, which is not on our uh, phylogenetic tree, uh, if, you go, if we were to expand it here. Um, so we're beginning with that right about here, and then it's a time lapse, uh, and we'll go all the way up to Homo sapiens and then reverse it quickly, just so you can see. Um, it's a neat video. You can see you know, the jaw uh, coming back in. Facial structure changing. Obviously to a more slender face. Actually better on your computer than on the do we need to turn off the lights? Would that be helpful? Put one of those. Yeah. If this is Aurora Tugenensis, it's not on our phylogenetic tree. It's about six million years ago. Right. So as you can see, uh, there's a change in the jaw structure right around here. development. Here you can see a pronounced brow ridge. This is around Homo <coughs> neanderthalensis. And Homo heidelbergensis. And current Homo sapiens. First, the time lapse. All right. So that is our presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, uh, here are our citations. If there are any questions, we'll take those now. the basic what we wanted to highlight like major like we're obviously still evolving like it's always happening but like these are just like there could be endless amounts from like like thousands of years ago but these are like what we mainly found research on what we mainly thought was the most important key traits to highlight in our presentation so when did homo sapiens land on scene when we show up so you can see um, homo sapiens are right here. Um, they're pretty recently actually, uh, 0.5 million years, like around now to a little later, yeah, yeah. 250,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty recent actually. Those were good questions anymore. So, what did um, so in early? Four hominids. What did the, what was the value of that big canine? Of the teeth. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. They said it was a lot for seeds, which um, was really interesting. Um, when we were talking about this graph, it says, "Can you click to the picture so they can see it?" Yes. Okay. So in this graph, you can see that the C3 foods um, consisted of the seeds and the nuts. So a lot of that was used for that. So I guess for like breaking open the nuts or the, uh, or the seeds, stuff like that. Anything else? We good? Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs>